Hello everyone, can you hear me? Um, thank you for coming, and tonight is a special day because we are going to have a uh, distinguished uh, quantum, um, uh, distinguish, uh, quantum speaker, and uh, uh, we are going to have here uh, Professor John Martinez. So I recently was in a meeting with John Martinez, and uh, he introduced himself saying, I'm John Martinez, do you need to know anything else? So I thought it was, uh, it was kind of funny, but I felt, you know, maybe for those of you that don't know him, um, let me just have, say a few words. John Martinez uh, received a BS in uh, physics in 1980, and a PhD in physics from the University of California, my alma mater as well, during his PhD. Uh, he investigated uh, quantum behavior or phase difference across the Josephson Tunnel Junction. So after his PhD, he spent one and a half years in Paris, in the CEA in Saclay, and then uh, he went to uh, Boulder for, uh, at NIST, uh, where he uh, started working on superconducting quantum interference devices, squids, amplifiers. So uh, since the 1980s, he has been a pioneer in experiments in superconducting cupids, and since the 1990s, he's really been working on uh, uh, a, a with the declared aim to build a first practical quantum computer. So you're going to hear this tonight. Um, in 2004, he joined UCSB, and in 2014, uh, his whole team was hired by Google to build the first useful quantum computer. Um, and uh, that resulted in a famous paper that you probably read uh, in uh, 2019 on quantum supremacy. Um, he left Google in 2020 and went and moved back to UCSB uh, through nine months uh, as sabbatical uh, in uh, Australia, working with Michel Simmons. John Martinez has been awarded the London Prize in Low Temperature Physics in 2014 and his work uh, for his work in his field, in this field, and he has been awarded the John Stewart Bell Prize in 2021 for his research on fundamental issues in quantum mechanics uh, and their applications. So with this, I'd like to invite John to the stage, and uh, uh, I'd like to thank you very much for being here, and uh, give you the floor. John, the floor is yours. <coughs> Thank you. You can hear me? Okay? Okay. So uh, physicists have been making this wild claim since the late 1980s that you can do powerful quant computation with quantum mechanics. And okay, so we've been trying to build a quantum computer and do something useful with it. I had the real pleasure to move to Google about 10 years ago to try to build such a quantum computer. The problem with Google is they're kind of hard-nosed engineers. They have these huge data centers. And it was very hard for the executives to understand that this little physics experiment here could outperform one of their giant data centers. So they were very skeptical that, you know, what the heck is Google doing this for? So as we were kind of understanding it and thinking about what we wanted to do next, we decided we wanted to do this quantum supremacy experiment where although we're not solving a useful problem yet, we are solving a kind of a simple mathematical problem that would show that the um, quantum computer could be powerful. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. And it's nice because they kind of gave us the, the carrot that if you could you know, show this experiment, then they would you know, further fund the, the project, which is what they're doing, and now they have quite a large project to try to do this. So today I just want to talk a little bit about that, uh, talk about how is quantum computing a powerful a computation paradigm, talk about superconducting qubits, how we did it, and then basically discuss the quantum supermics experiment where we took data for about 200 seconds, and uh, if you wanted to check if your data was good, it would take thousands of years People, theorists have improved upon that. That number's uh, smaller now, but it just shows you there's a big gap between um, 
uh, you know, quantum computing, how powerful it is. Now, there might be some people in the audience who are not physicists, so I want to talk about quantum mechanics just for one slide. Uh, and uh, I want to talk about, let's say, the hydrogen atom, and just to introduce it this way. You know that the hydrogen atom is made from a proton and electron, and that they're going to attract each other. And the basic physics question you get with that kind of model is that why do atoms have size? Why do we have size? Okay, because if these two particles are going to attract each other, well, then, you know, they're going to stick together. And quantum mechanics says that actually atoms have size and that the atom is just not a classical particle, but it's forming some kind of cloud around the nucleus that has some size to it. But the amazing thing about this cloud, it's not like these are the electrons randomly bouncing around here, but it's in a very definite what kind of wave function state, we call it, that's a very precise, very mathematical state. And, uh, and, and because of this precise mathematical description of this kind of cloud, we can then do computation, it turns out. Now, when you want to do the computation, you want to translate the behavior of the atom and abstract it away to something we can do manipulations on. And what we do is we abstract so that the ground state of the hydrogen atom, uh, shown at the top, is our zero state. And then the first excited state uh, of, the, of the atom, it's kind of a stationary eigenstate, we put into the one state, we say is the one state. And then we can take light and pulse this to make transitions between zero and one and do, uh, do logic based on that because quantum mechanics is very precise description of what happens to these states, okay? So just abstracting that away, we just say that in these quantum systems, we in some sense define a zero to one state that are natural states of the system. And what you can do in quantum mechanics is just like you can say an electron is at this side of the proton and this side of the proton at the same time, you can say that these, these are two, both in the states zero and one at the same time. And what this is interesting in, in, in terms of computation is that it's, you can put it in this state and this allows you to essentially do a parallel computation of the zero state and the one state running through one processor at one time to get the answer to what is zero state of the one state. So it's a parallel processor. Now you could say, ah, oh, that's great, factor two, parallel processing, but what's the, what's the big deal? You know, that, that's not very much. And what you can do is you can then add more qubits to the system. And if you have two qubits, and you have a zero plus one state in two qubits, that's, that's a superposition of zero, 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 one, one, zero, and one, one. So you've doubled, multiplied by two, the number of states by adding a two, another qubit. Three qubits, you have eight states, four qubits, 16 states, so it's growing exponentially. The amount of parallelization is growing exponentially with the number of qubits, which typically doesn't happen in, in uh, computation. And what's nice is by the time you get to two to the 50 states, you're looking at something that's going to compete against a supercomputer. And if you could eventually build one with 300 states, two to the 300 is a number that's greater than the number of atoms kind of in the universe. So clearly, at that size, you're going to do some interesting uh, computation. Now that all sounds nice, but you have to remember that when you do this computation through your quantum computer, at the end you have to measure the state. This is kind of the laws of quantum mechanics as you do that. And then you only get n bits of information. So you kind of collapse the amount of information in that. And because of that, only certain algorithms will work so that when you measure it, you get some interesting information you're going to need for that. So you can't run any you know, algorithm on your running on your cell phone and make it uh, better, but it's only for special algorithms. And let's just talk about that a little bit. I mean, this all kind of started in earnest in the, the early 1990s with short factoring algorithm, which basically says you could take a big integer and then factor it into its two primes. And since that's the basis 
uh, much of uh, encryption, RSA encryption, you can break that. Uh, that's still a worry, and people worry about the safety of the internet. But the nice thing is, is there are now quantum resistant protocols where it's, uh, you, you won't be able to break it with a quantum computer. And people are doing research and going to port those quantum resistance uh, protocols into it. And, uh, you know, I'm not too worried about that being a big problem. I think a, a really interesting application is quantum chemistry. Okay, simulating the physical system with quantum mechanical electrons with your quantum computer. This is in fact what Feynman talked about in the 1980s when he was first thinking about this. And there's a, there's a natural mapping of qubits to electrons, although that took one or two decades to figure out how to do that well. So there's many, of course, technical applications. There are known algorithms. We know what to build to do this. I think it's very exciting and could be very powerful and, and a real application for this. However, the big money application is kind of quantum artificial intelligence and optimization. Think of it as a traveling salesman problem, which I did here. Have a bunch of cities, what's the shortest route between them? There are good classical algorithms, but the hope is that you can get better algorithms with uh, a quantum computer. Unfortunately, there's, unlike the quantum chemistry, there's no known algorithms to do that. And, uh, you know, people are, are, are working on that. However, if you had a quantum problem and you had to uh, kind of do some machine learning on that, it looks like that's going to work properly. So maybe this combined with quantum chemistry will give you a, a, a further good problem. But this is people are working on. We don't know whether we can do it or not. A lot of heuristics involved here. Uh, but you know, people are, are really trying to understand if you can solve the problems this way. And it might possible, might we do, do that. So I'm an experimentalist, so I'm going to focus on how do we build a quantum computer. So the first thing you would think about is if you can code a hydrogen atom, zero and one, why don't you just get a molecule and you encode the electron states in some way and, and you build a quantum computer out of that. And people with NMR started to do that. But there's a problem here, okay? And the problem is, if you want to control that with light, it's a thousand times bigger than, uh, than these, uh, these individual atoms. So how do you control one atom and not the one next to it? If you come in with a magnetic field, it's the same way. You can't make a little coil around a little atom. You, you don't have that material. So in fact, control of a quantum computer is a, a big problem. And uh, in order to solve this problem, people have invented a wide number of physical systems. And I'm going to say the one thing in common of all these systems is they're much bigger than the size of atoms. Okay, You might use an atom, but it's in an ion trap where the ions are microns apart. You have a superconducting system that's maybe a millimeter to a centimeter apart. Uh, spin qubits are microns a pot. So they're big enough so that you can bring in control systems and control the individual quantum states. So it's very interesting. There's a whole bunch of physical systems. There's many organizational approach from large companies to university research. And uh, it's just very vibrant to try to you know, figure out what's, what's going to work here. Now, one of the things I want to do is talk about how you discuss programming these circuits and operating them. And for the electrical engineers in the, uh, in the department, you use, you use a Boolean logic. So you can take a bunch of AND gates and OR gates and exclusive OR gates and wire them together to build logic. This is uh, something called a, a full adder. So you can add two numbers together using uh, the, you know, some structure based on that. And, uh, and you, you, know, you have the basic gates and you can put it together. In quantum, it's a certain, like that. Only here you have the qubits. In this case, there's W qubits. And then over time, instead of flowing it over space, but over time, you do certain operations. You do a single qubit operation, or you do two qubit operations where you see they're connected. And you do a series of them, and then at the end, you measure it, and then you get the result of your quantum computation. And just like for classical logic, where you have an AND gate and a NOT gate, 
you can then build an arbitrary classical logic in the quantum you can have a certain uh, uh, chi an arbitrary single qubit gate and the two qubit gate you put them together you can do an arbitrary calculation so it really uh, tracks into what's going on with classically only your instruction set your logic gates are much bigger and fuller than what you got classically and thus you can do these kind of strange powerful calculations that I was talking about but the concepts are, are, uh, are quite uh, similar. Now, at this point, I want to do something that many speakers don't do in quantum computing, and that is to tell you what's really hard about this and why it's taking so darn long to build a quantum computer. And the problem is, is qubits are fundamentally error prone. We're trying to make better qubits, less errors over time. Eventually, we're going to do error correction, error detection correction, to get rid of the errors and really reduce it. But it's the fundamental problem here. Okay, and kind of the analogy here is if you had a classical bit, it's like a coin on a table. Who has a coin in their pocket? So I'll use my cell phone. So you have a cell phone, and that's going to represent the zero state, and upside down is going to represent the one state. And what's nice about the zero and one state is I can have some noise in the system, jiggle this around a little bit, and it's not going to flip over unless you're, you, know, you do it too much. But it's fundamentally stable because of this. In a quantum system, it's like the cell phone floating in space. This is the zero state, and this is the one state. And then the zero plus one state is just rotated 90 degrees. And there's something called a quantum mechanical phase that you can have and rotating it this way. This is called a block sphere for the physicists, of course. And uh, that. now you see there's no preferred direction here. So if you have a little bit of noise to the system, it'll cause this to rotate a little bit and give you an error. And uh, kind of this analog nature of it is what uh, makes it uh, qubits fundamentally be error, error, uh, error prone. And you have to you know, have to be very careful how you operate this to get it to work. But it's possible to accurately control these and get some results. And we'll show you in the answer, what in the talk, what happens to that. So, you know, talking about errors, when you look at classical CMOS, I was building TTL circuits in the late 1960s as a student. There, you know, fabrication wasn't great. You can make about a thousand transistors in a circuit. You choose the ones that work, build it up, you can build a real circuit. And then, what, 40 years later, the error, fabrication error of transistors are like 10 to minus 10. So you can build really complicated chips. Uh, the same kind of thing happens here. You have W qubits, you have a, a, a instruction sets. One, two, three, all the way up to D. The number of gates is W times D. And if there's an error rate per gate, which is roughly this memory time divided by the gate, gate time, one over the error of the gate, uh, that's kind of how many operations you can do before you get an error and then things stop aren't working so well. And the sad truth is, is that for W of 100, these are systems people are building, and with an error of 10 to minus 2, the depth is 1. Or maybe 2 or 3. It'll work sometimes. So what can you do with a depth, with, uh, with a, a program with three instructions in it? OK? That's not very good. OK? So uh, I, I'm just saying, this is the thing that we really have to fix here. Now, if you get to an error of 10 to minus 4, then with 100 qubits, you can do a depth of 100, and then that starts getting interesting. So that's where we're going. And the whole quantum supremacy experiment we did, this error was a little bit lower than that. And working through this, you can just barely start to do something really powerful. And uh, it, it's improving over time, so uh, we, can do, we can do more and more. So that's the big problem that you have to do. OK, so now let's talk about superconducting qubits. And here's a, 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 a photograph and under a microscope where the dark tan is aluminum and the, the where tan is aluminum and the dark is where there's no aluminum. So you have a cross in a ground plane with wires coming into it. 
The nice thing about superconducting qubits is that they're macroscopic, and that's, uh, it's easy to bring in wires. You see in the left, on the right and on the bottom, bring in these microwave wires and control it very accurately. Okay, so you have room. It's big enough to do the control like they talked about. It has engineered properties, so we can use electromagnetic and circuit theory to figure out how it works and design it quite sophisticated. I'd say about 60, 70% of the design is just circuits and microwave engineering, and about 30% is quantum mechanics. So there's, you have a lot of tools to do that. And then, of course, once you build one, you can then build a lot of them using the, the computer chip technology of a clean room to do that. So that's all nice. But of course, the problem is this is so big and all these defects can affect it. So it's taken a long time for people to figure out how to like, get that to work properly. And uh, so what happens here is this cross forms a capacitor. And this at the bottom is the Josephson junction, which is just two aluminum metals crossing each other with a thin aluminum oxide between the two. So superconducting electrons can tunnel through that and forms what's called, what is a nonlinear inductor. And that nonlinear inductor can be mapped to a pendulum, a very simple pendulum. And if, if you remember from the physics, this has harmonic oscillator motion, but as the amplitude gets bigger and bigger, the oscillation frequency goes down, so it's a nonlinear pendulum. And of course, the oscillation frequency goes to zero when it's perfectly uh, going up. And, uh, and what you can do is you can map the no energy to ground state as a zero, like I did before, and then one excitation, microwave excitation, is in the one state. So you have a kind of a, a classical view on the top, you have wave functions, if you want to look at the quantum mechanics, and you can kind of understand it in a simple way. So this is, this is a microwave oscillator at about 5, 6 gigahertz. And uh, mostly you can understand this by, by understanding it's just an inductor capacitor resonator. A little bit more physics, but it, 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 it's not too bad to understand it that way. So here's uh, experimental data that kind of shows how it works for a single qubit. Uh, I have, we start here, zero, uh, you then put on microwaves that got uh, uh, emitted from the side, and then, uh, uh, and then after a certain amount of time, it, it, well, excuse me, after that microwaves, you then stop the microwaves and then measure whether you're in the zero or one state. So if you uh, look at this, at time equals zero, the probability that you're in the ground state goes all the way up to one. And then when you put on microwaves resonant with this transition for, what is it, uh, uh, 40 nanoseconds, oh, excuse me, 20 nanoseconds right here, you then go from a zero state to a one state. Okay, so the microwave put it, puts an energy into it. And classically, that's what you call a not gate, a zero to go to one. And of course, a not gate, classically, a one goes to zero, so if you put in microwaves for 20 nanoseconds and then add it for additional 20 nanoseconds, 40 nanoseconds total, you go back up to the, to, to the probability of zero being one. So, you know, from computer engineering, a not gate and a not gate is an identity gate. And you see this goes back and forth over time. So you can do it a bunch of times. Now what's new and interesting is instead of pulsing it for 20 nanoseconds, you have that to 10 nanoseconds, and then you see the probability of the zero state is 0.5. And this is exactly the zero plus one state I was showing you before, okay? And then you see if you do 10 nanoseconds and 10 nanoseconds, you get a knot. So the knot and knot was identity, and something and something is a knot, what do you call that gate? Well, classically, you could call that a square root of knot gate. Of course, you know, what does that mean? You don't know what that means classically, but quantum mechanically, that has a very definite meaning. You know what's how you're processing the state, and you can use that, as I discussed before, to do develop a, a complicated algorithm. So, uh, so, so that's the basic single qubit gates. You see this goes up and down. And you see over here at about a little bit less than 200 nanoseconds, 
It's not like going down to the bottom again. And that's because there's these little errors that I was talking about. And the characteristic memory time of the qubit is about 20 nanoseconds, 15, 20 nanoseconds. So we can do about 1,000 operations uh, on a, a, you know, a single gate before you kind of lose the memory. And that's enough to do something powerful and interesting. OK. So uh, you know, to talk about one, so for the quantum supremacy experiment, we built this uh, Sycamore processor with 54 qubits. Uh, what it is, it's a rectangular array where the crosses are these qubits, as I showed you before. And then between them, we have what's called adjustable couplers. So it allows the qubit to talk to its neighbor, but we can electronically adjust how strong the coupling and that coupling can go to zero. Okay? Uh, and then the nice thing, this is with four nearest neighbors. Uh, this is forward compatible to do uh, surface code error correction, which is what we're going to want to do. So it's a, a chip we designed to be along the way to do something more powerful. So here's the chip here. This is actually two chips. The qubit chip is on top, it's smaller. And then the bottom chip is more or less the wiring, which brings out all the control signals from the chip by Indian bump rungs and brings it out to the outside. Uh, so that we can control it. And then that chip here is put into a package, which is basically a printed circuit board, and we wire bond from the chip to the circuit board, and then that goes out to an array of microwave connectors. And then those, uh, this whole thing is put in something called a dilution refrigerator, which gets to very low temperature. So room temperature is 300 Kelvin, this is about a hundredth of one Kelvin, so it's 10 to minus 4 room temperature. And by getting to low temperature, you can then um, uh, uh, make sure that the thermal energy of the system, the amount of jiggling of the state, is way less than the typical quantum energy of the system, and then you can see the quantum mechanics. And, you know, people all, uh, always say, oh, 10 millikelvin, you have this crazy dilution refrigerator. Well, this is something you just buy, okay? And they spend some money for it, but this technology exists. We know the wiring. And then since we operate at 5 gigahertz, that's basically cell phone frequencies. So that's relatively easy to build these control signals. So we purposely make it hard with the, uh, you know, by going to low temperature, but the manufacturer of the chip is easier. The microwaves are easier. Microwave engineering is easier and thus you can you know, build these complex systems. And then on the right, you see the wires come up out of the dilution refrigerator and then goes to a rack of electronics, uh, high speed. These are basically made with field grammar gate arrays and kind of uh, chips that you would see kind of in a cell phone base station in order to generate all the control signals for lots of qubits. Of course, there's lots of software you know, getting this to, to work properly. Um, I'm going to go over this very quickly. Uh, what we have here is how we do the adjustable coupling. We have a qubit to the left, a qubit to the right here in brown. There's a green qubit in the center that's at a slightly different frequency. And by changing that frequency of the qubit, uh, you can then adjust the, the amount of coupling between the left qubit and the right qubit. And these kind of oscillations here versus this coupler bias uh, shows you that in certain locations there are no oscillations and that's turning off the interaction. And if you move the current away from that, either more or less, you can then turn on these oscillations and that's swapping energy from one qubit to the other and that is, creates a, gate a two qubit gate operation in order to do that. Now, this gets a little bit technical on some of the measurements we're doing here, but it's actually an important part of what this experiment showed. So I have to explain this. We build these qubits, and I said that they don't operate perfectly. So the first thing we do is build this array, and we start measuring how well the qubits do. So we, for example, we turn off all the couplers except for one qubit, and we do this um, operation like I showed before, doing a bunch of knot gates and square root of knot gates to see how well it works. 
And we do this, uh, uh, you know, in, in a series of experiments to figure out what is the error due to that. And that error is typically around 10 to minus 3. So we can do about 10 to the 3 operations before the, the qubit kind of loses its initial memory state. So we do that on each of them. And then we kind of histogram that. And in fact, what we do is we give it a, uh, a, a cumulative histogram. So think of it as a histogram where, uh, uh, think of it as a histogram uh, that's integrated here. And that's the dashed line at e, E1. And that's kind of like 0.15% medium error. So you do about 600 operations, okay. Then what we do is instead of doing each one individually, when you run an algorithm, you're going to have all of these operating in parallel. That's how the transistor is working here, right? You're doing a complicated thing. So you want to know, well, what happens when we run the, the, whole, the whole thing? So what we do is all the couplers are off, and then we just do the same experiment, but we're doing it on all the qubits at the same time. And when you do that, you get the black line by E1. And you see it shifted a little bit to the right, which is like there's a little bit extra errors, and that's because there's crosstalk and other imperfections to it. But it only shifts it by a small amount. That's a good sign. Okay, that means that, yeah, we kind of have things working right. We do the same thing for E2, where you're doing two qubit operations. We do uh, isolated. And uh, that's, that's worse, because there's two qubits and the like. But now when we do them all simultaneously, it shifts a little bit more to the right than we would like. But OK, it's still what? It goes from 0.36 to 0.62%. So you do that with readout, and you, know, you kind of figure out how well everything's working. OK. So it's the metrology. How well are we doing? How did all the qubits look? Yeah, that's fine. But there's a question is you're kind of doing this uh, both isolated and simultaneous, but when you run a complicated algorithm, like you're running a complicated and program here, you want to know when you're running that full program, are you going to get these kind of errors? Or do things all go to hell and not work very well? You don't know that, okay? So what I'm going to do is show you the quantum supremacy experiment. In fact, the quantum supremacy experiment can tell you how well things are working. And you want to know that. If you're going to build a big quantum computer, you, you need to know if, if things are, are going to mess up when you do a complicated calculation. So uh, and I'll get to that and show, show that, uh, but this, this is where, what we're doing here. So in this slide, I'm going to show you that you have 53 out of the 54 qubits. And in the upper right, it's showing versus time the kind of operations that you're doing. When you see a single circle, that's a not gate or square root of not gate, as I talked about before. And then if you have a circle with a line between it, this is a two qubit gate, kind of these swap operations. And uh, you just cycle through that with the swap operations cycling around to the four different neighbors versus time. So if you look at a center patch of here, you can see you have the square root of not operations and then a two qubit, a square root of nine operations, and more, more uh, qubits. And it just cycles through the various nearest neighbors. So this particular sequence of single qubit and two qubit operations is an arbitrary kind of algorithm you would do if you wanted to run a quantum algorithm. This is, you would compile it into these basic operations. Okay, so it's kind of a general circuit. It's a good thing to check whether it's working right. And, uh, and you know, you go through and you cycle through that, and then after n cycles here, you then do a measurement of the device, uh, the measurement of the qubit states. And the single qubit gates, these microwave pulses, are about 25 nanoseconds long, and the two qubit gates are actually a little bit faster. They're about 12 nanoseconds. So the coherence time of each qubit is about 15, 20 microseconds. So you can do a you know, get, get a decent number of gates in order to run a complex algorithm. We'd like to make it longer, but it's, it's fine. OK. So that's the basic general thing. Now, what do we do in the quantum supremacy 
uh, algorithm. It's actually, as I was talking about earlier, a validation algorithm to see how this, check how this thing is working. It's really kind of an interesting thing to do. So it checks a general purpose circuit. And what you're doing in this algorithm is you're generating a random number, quantum mechanically. Which sounds kind of, you know, boring, but in fact, the algorithm has some really interesting features to it. And the feature is, is that when you take just randomly chosen, but known, gates, and you sequence this through and then measure at the end, you're going to basically get an output of all the possible combinations of 0, 1. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, etc. All possible combinations. But unlike your, your classical intuition that these are completely random, some of those states have higher probability of being measured than some of the other states. But, you know, not, not by a lot, but there's some correlation to these states. And this is very much analogous to what's known as laser spe speckle, where you take, and it's shown on the right, you take a laser beam and you put it through frosted glass, which then bends out the beam. And in some directions, the laser waves are coming and constructively interfering and giving you a bright spot. But in some other directions, they're destructively interfering and giving you dark. And it's only because you're putting through a coherent laser beam that you can see these destructive and constructive and destructive path and seeing speckle. If you put in white light, incoherent light, you don't see it. So because the quantum computer is doing the quantum calculation coherently, then you will see this essentially laser speckle, qubit speckle. Some are brighter than others. So that's what you do is you go through, you take your algorithm, you go through the chip, and then you sample the states. And those are going to should be the bright states, the higher probability states. But you want to check that. Okay, is it the bright states? So what you do is you take the same quantum circuit and you abstract it away to qubit operations like I talk about, and you send it through a computer or a supercomputer, which then gives you the probabilities and computes the speckle properly. And then you take these two paths and you correlate them with something called cross entropy fidelity, which is basically the measured blue X's, but the probabilities calculated. Okay? And if these probabilities are kind of random, it's going to be 1 over 2 to the n, and the fidelity is going to be 0. But it turns out that if you have this full quantum coherence and you do this calculation, you then get a fidelity one that's a perfect match. Okay? So you can check how close, you know, was the quantum computer to what you expected it to be. Okay? Now, what's really interesting about this is if you take this and you put a not gate somewhere in this whole thing, you know, let's say you compiled it wrong. There was an error in your code. With one not gate put anywhere in here, you will get a fidelity equal to zero. So it has to be a perfect match to get a fidelity in one. So one error, you get zero, your experiment fails. This is really good for an experimentalist because you know when you're making a mistake, right? This is really handy. And then if you see a signal, it's like you've done everything. And you can chuck that in the light. So it's very useful because you can check that the, you're really simulating these qubits exactly how you're thinking you're doing abstractly with mathematics. And if you don't get a fidelity one, then you say some fraction of the time there's errors in, and you know what fraction of time, and you can tell what's going on. You don't expect a fidelity one because these are real qubits, but you can tell how well it's matching. So this is really, really useful to, to say what the hell's going on. So this is the data that we published in our paper. Um, we have the number of qubits in uh, the bottom. Uh, and uh, we, we have a patch of 53, but we start with only 12 qubits out of that big patch, you know, just to make sure it's working okay. 
And if you look at it, this cross entropy fidelity is about uh, 40%. So roughly half the time it works, and half the time there is error in the qubit, phase flip or bit flip, and you got zero then because uncorrelated it. It's about 40% of the time it's working. Okay, and that's the red circle. And then as you increase the number of qubits, there are more and more uh, possible errors in your system because there's more qubits. And uh, the cross entropy fidelity goes down, as you expect, and it goes down exponentially. That's the, way, that's the way the math works. And then it goes down and down, and by the time you get to 53, it's a pretty low value, but uh, you can, you can calculate, you, you, you can still measure something. Okay? Now, to compute the cross entropy fidelity, it's kind of a little bit difficult at the end. First of all, in the beginning, for 12, 20 qubits, you can use your laptop. Then you go to a workstation. And then, you know, at the end, you have to use a big Google data center to, to calculate that properly. But in this particular case, we were able to do that all the way up to 53. And uh, you see, there's not very many points at the end because even for Google, it was a little bit expensive. So we were trying to save the planet, okay? Now, um, uh, one of the things you can do is check if this is working properly. Can you get into this quantum supremacy regime? So it turns out in this red system, there's a certain sequence to couple to the neighbors, and there's this mathematical trick that can simplify your calculation, and you can actually calculate it. But you can also change the sequence very slightly in the right, and then you can't use that math trick anymore. And now, when you take the data at 53 qubits and increase the number of cycles, you, there's no red circles anymore. You can't check it, OK? But what you can do is split the circuit up into two. You could say, look at the patch, where the two patches aren't coupled to each other. But then the calculation's way simpler. It's half as big. Okay, so then you can check it, and you can do something in between, and in that case, you have the check. You can do the check here, you can do the check on the left-hand data, which basically is equal to the, the original data. And that that's, makes sense, because it's more or less the same number of gates, so the error is going to be about the same. So with the proxy, you can see how it's going. And you can see we're seeing a finite cross entropy benchmarking. These are five sigma error bars, uh, you know. And uh, you know, if we could check it, then we 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 say the red circles would be there. And the nice thing is, in the intervening three years, the theorists got really motivated to try to you know break this and 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 to make it better. We put the data online. They've been able to check the data. And indeed, the red circles now you know, cross through our data points as you, as you expect. And of course, there's a little bit of race, so they've been able to reproduce this data uh, fairly readily at this point. But now they made a 70 qubit chip, and now they have a similar plot where people haven't been able to check it again to help motivate people in the future. So there's this nice race going on. So, um, so that, that's all great. That shows you're doing a very complicated calculation that uh, at least initially you couldn't check, and now you can check, but then there's more data. Shows it's powerful. Now let's go back to my validation issue. There's this black line here that's basically going through all the data. And that's the prediction from the gate and measurement errors. This was from the data that I showed you before for single and two qubits taken simultaneously. And if you use those numbers, it gives you that black line prediction which exactly goes through the data. This was like one of the biggest surprises in my career to see how well this worked. Because usually as an experimentalist, something's gonna go wrong, like this should have been worse. But I'm going to say we worked for quite a few years to get rid of various systematic errors, and it was really great to see that it worked properly. And in fact, it's interesting. This okay. Yeah. So we have small errors. I'm talking about errors. So in number two, the prediction for the fidelity 
is just given by one minus the error of all the operations. This is high school statistics, okay? And it's totally amazing to me that although you can get these very powerful quantum predictions using this, this new kind of, uh, you know, quantum mechanics, uh, that um, the errors is high school statistics. It's really simple. And it's because they're uncorrelated errors and the like. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's a really, really simple, uh, simple prediction. And given that this works so well, this is good evidence as we go ahead and we try to build more complicated devices and error correction that things should work. This is really good news. And the number one here, point out that if we do the full circuit, this alighted or patch circuit, the different complexities, vastly different complexity and computational difficulty, we get the same amount of fidelity. So the errors does not depend on the entanglement or computational complexity. That's again something, you know, that's important to note here. And then in the, the bottom here, uh, okay, the quantum works at 53 qubits. That's a 10 to the 16 Hilbert space. I mean, up to that, and people may be tested. A thousand of this parallel space here. It's really great to see that it works. And for those of you who might be interested in error correction, you can look at how the error correction works very carefully in this bottom right graph. And uh, it basically shows that you can digitize your errors in the way people have talked about theoretically. And we really see that in this very complicated algorithm. Uh, we, we see this digitization of errors that makes it very easy to understand how things work. So since then, this is after the first year or two years or so, at Google they've run a bunch of different algorithms. There's a lot more from here. What I want to point out is they're running algorithms with hundreds to thousands of these logic aids. And the point here is with this and then other computers, quantum computers, people are too, we're now at the range where we're, we're running real algorithms with lots of gates, com complex, and although these particular data is not in a quantum supremacy regime, you can simulate that. You can start simulating very complex algorithms and, uh, you know, get reasonable answers out of it and try to test out what the algorithms are, are, are doing and, and show if, if things are working right. So, so this is, uh, this is uh, good for the, the field that we can do that. I also wanted to show uh, a graph that I saw uh, last week uh, this is data from Caltech where they're making Rydberg atoms. These are neutral atoms in a vacuum where they put on a laser pulse to make them, the atoms essentially big, and then they can talk to each other. And uh, there's a Hamiltonian that describes what's going on when you're doing these pulses. But what happens is even though there's a very complex kind of interaction between all these neutral atoms when you do this, you can write down the Hamiltonian of what that interaction is. Uh, you can do the experiment to clean this cross-entropy fidelity, and then you can compare it to what you're getting, uh, what you're expecting from um, uh, the mathematics. And again, what this does is it tests, is the quantum evolution of this very complicated system here in neutral atoms, what you expect from, you know, given whatever the Hamiltonian is, whatever the de gate description. And the cross entropy fidelity here goes down as you do more and more operations, but it goes down in a, in a good way. And it's nice that this whole cross entropy fidelity that we've demonstrated here is now used, being used by other qubit groups to test to see if the system performance is working well. And in fact, this, this is quite good performance tells you a lot, and I'm really happy people in the field are doing that. So with that, I, I will uh, uh, summarize and talk about the outlook a little bit. Uh, very simple, that um, it's possible to do powerful and complex, build powerful and complex quantum computers right now, and they work as expected. Uh, you know, there's no new physics that we saw if you get everything working right. And uh, you, know, you, you know that whatever it's calculating 
is backed up by your abstraction of just the qubit logic that you're, you're doing. And that's really good. And we first have to build bigger computers and see if it still works, but that's nice. And the next thing we want to do is build a useful quantum computer, which I think people have said we can call that not, you know, quantum supremacy. We now want to do quantum utility, okay? And I'm going to say the quantum utility is going to be very interesting if we can start solving useful problems for industry, not just publishing nature and science papers, which is good, but, you know, to useful problems, then people in the industry will want to pay for using a quantum computer, and then that funding means that we can put part of that back into building more and more better quantum computers, hire more of you to build those quantum computers, and this kind of virtual cycle of putting more and more funding is what makes present-day electronics so good. So that's a big uh, milestone that people want to work out. There's a lot of people doing it. It's a little bit hard, okay? We have a gap. The, the hardware only works so well, okay? And we have, can have, you know, a few thousand gates. And then we have to have algorithms that generally need more and they need high accuracy. We have to come up, somehow simplifying the algorithms. And the hope is that we can close this gap and then, and then do something. And I, for me, it's very exciting because tomorrow, you know, I can get, get an email from someone, someone maybe claiming that they've done that. And then the, the, the world of quantum computing will really change. I think it's gonna take a little bit more time. Uh, it's hard, but I feel optimistic that if you get the right people together and work hard on doing this, it's possible to close that gap and really start building amazing computational machines with quantum. So with that, thank you very much, and I'd love to take questions. Thank you. Thank you for this inspiring presentation. I'd like to open up the floor for questions. Yes, Vincenzo. Very interesting, uh, fascinating. Uh, uh, I, you saw, uh, you showed that uh, there is a there is an error that is intrinsic to each quantum bit. Uh, I would say local, and then there is an overhead error. I would say which comes from uh, you showed that this, when you do two qubit gates, then uh, having the, having two qubit operations simultaneously gives you an additional error. Yeah, so that's This right. I would call a collective effect. So now, if you if you okay. if you optimize single qubits. Okay, does it really make sense? Because that, that additional error is a collective effect that will be present nevertheless. So does this effect represent a, a physical limitation to so, what to compute to scaling? And if not, uh, how are you going to solve it? Yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, but the basic idea is when we did it, not, when we did it simultaneous, Single qubits were okay, but the two qubits got worse. And you're basically seeing crosstalk effects there. And you know, you think you turn it off, but it's not turned off so well, and you have to do it. So um, you have to you work very hard to do that. And you know, I, I talked to someone from the Google group earlier this week. They've been working on all this and making the qubits better. And now that gap has, has narrowed down. They, they make a little bit better. It, it's still a hard thing to narrow that, you know, the, the, that, that gap there to zero. But, uh, yeah. And, and th this is basically when you operate a complex system, you get crosstalk of various kinds. And by working on the calibration hard and working on the design of the qubits, you can make it better. So, you know, there they, they were showing data at uh, 70 qubits and their, uh, all their errors were down by not quite a factor or two, about 30, 40 percent. And you know, they've just been working on it for years, and which is what you have to do. Now my, my thing uh, in terms of improve this is that the real problem with these devices was the T1 was 15 microseconds. And you know, people could make superconducting qubits with 100, 200, 300 millisecond T1s. The reason why it wasn't so good, it's a very complicated chip. 
you have all these extra surfaces and things you worry about. But I think it's possible to build this architecture with this. So we should be able to get 10 times better. And then, you know, with 10 times better memory time, you can figure out the crosstalk better. So I think an order of magnitude improvement on the numbers I gave here is quite possible. Uh, so, you know, that's certainly what I'm interested in doing and, you know, other people, uh, you know, understand. So, so there's, there's a long way to go here. Thank you very much. Another question. Yes. So what we're building here is a general purpose quantum computer where you can program it however you want. And you know, with that one slide, they've done a bunch of different algorithms where you can tailor that to different algorithms. And uh, you know, uh, in, in principle, uh, you, can, you can solve any problem with it, but it just may not, it, the algorithm just may be too long for you to fit it on the present uh, hardware. So, uh, and then, you know, at that point, what you want to do really in the long term is build the error correction. So you get very low errors, and then you could do many, many gates, and then you can uh, couple the logical qubits together to do whatever algorithm you want. So in, in principle, this is being designed to be general purpose, just like a regular computer is. Uh, but of course, in the field, it is hard to do right now, so people are building uh, 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 quantum computers with certain architecture and structure to more directly simulate these problems. And that's a very interesting uh, uh, thing, the uh, uh, direction people are going. But yeah, we tried to build something general purpose. More questions? Here. Here. And then there's... Okay. Okay. So, so as we scale up, it's as we scale up. So, as you scale up one or two qubits, you learn a certain amount about how they work. But it wasn't until we got to five to ten that we really started to understand like what would happen as we scale. And um, what happened is when we went to 5 to 10, because we've been thinking very carefully about it, it just worked great. So that's what happened at UCSB. And we very quickly made transmons and got it to 5 to 10. And you know we were doing the right architecture. And at that point, we felt very optimistic about scaling up. And fortunately, we moved to Google, which had a lot of funds to buy all the equipment we needed. And then basically going to 50 and now 70 has been, you know, basically working okay. Uh, but I would say at this point, we were able to scale up okay. What, we, what needs to be done is you have to make the qubits better. Longer coherence time, make sure that the gates are working properly. And that's kind of going back to the design. But uh, you know, I'd say at, at 5 or 10, you get a really good idea if your qubits are working right. And when you're at 50 or 100, you can, you can tell a lot about what your problems are. So these are big milestones. And, and, and follow-up question, I think it's a, you're expecting it. Then. What about uh, the importance of system, system engineering to actually achieve uh, this uh, scalability, not only for the qubits, but especially for the controller readout? OK, so um, thank you. I'm giving the talk on system engineering tomorrow, uh, which I'll talk about it more abstractly, but what I would say is we were working on system engineering for many years and trying to build scalable electronics and making the qubits better and, and improving the design. So uh, that, was, that was like a 10, 15 year effort. And what happened is by really focusing on it and having a lot of papers and PhD theses on that, 
when we went to the sycamore chip and did this, it basically worked out, you know, well enough. I mean, it was basically the first chip we tested worked great. Okay. And, uh, but it was after many years of system engineering, chip design, process engineering, control, figuring out how to calibrate the device. It, it, you know, that's the, that's the main thing you have to do. But that's, you know, you build, if you're going to build a computer, you know, okay, it's complicated. Well, I'll talk about it tomorrow. Yes, uh, over here. We have a question from Zoom. Um, do you think that another type of qubit, for example, plutoniums, may work uh, better than transmon? Uh, so, uh, um, the, the transmon, I chose the transmon because it could do a lot of all the operations, not the best in the world, but well, and all of them work at the same time. I think the Fluxonium may be able to do that, and it's good that people are looking at it. What you need to do is make a two qubit Fluxonium and show it works well, and the group uh, at MIT has done that. But that design does not look scalable beyond two qubits very easily. So I'm now waiting for the five qubit version, you know, to see how it works. And if it's still working well with very low error rates, then uh, I think that's going to be really exciting. So all of these things are good, but the hard part is, is can you get all the elements working at the same time in a system engineering way? And, you know, the only way to know that is for people to try and do the experiments. But again, at five, five or ten or... 50, you can really tell how, how it's working pretty well. Thank you for that great talk. Um, good morning. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I'm working uh, on superconductive digital electronics. And for many years, there are talks about superconductive digital circuitry uh, being used alongside superconductive qubits uh, for uh, better uh, control of. Uh, Qubits, natural uh, compatibility, and low uh, thermal noise. So, uh, what's your uh, from this uh, from your experience? What's your outlook on the uh, uh, future uh, of this idea? Uh, so, the the question is like you know thermal noise and other problems with the superconducting qubits. No. I, I didn't it's quite catch that. Superconducting digital electronics. Uh, superconducting digital electronics. Oh, okay. oh superconducting digital electronics. Yeah. Um, yeah, people are working on that, and I think uh, uh, it's really interesting for people to see if they can build that properly. The problem is is um, if you think about putting the superconducting digital electronics at, at the qubit, 10 milligrams dissipates, even that dissipates too much power. So you have to put it at three or four Kelvin. But there, the budget maybe looks okay. Um, I think the real problem is, is that although people have made simple circuits, uh, is, you, know, you have to build a pretty complicated control system and it's not 100% clear that you can build these digital classical superconducting circuits of that scale to get it to work. Uh, I'm very interested in learning more about cryo CMOS because the nice thing about CMOS is you can, you know, contract the TSMC and build essentially a perfect, you know, get an essentially perfect, uh, perfect uh, system. The only problem will be whether it's low enough power. So it's interesting, but I'm, you know, as you, whenever you build a big system, you'd like to buy your components and, you know, have, make sure that it all works and not have to do too much research to get it to work. So we'll see. Maybe in the long term. That there are programs to try to do that that's interesting. Thank you. Uh, there's a question down there. Question from Jim. How different are the Google chips from IBM? Uh, okay, so so the question was how different was this at IBM? And the, the big difference is that our gate errors were uh, way smaller. And, 
and that's why we could do the experiment. The other difference is, on average, they connect, connect to two and a half qubits, and we connect to four, and more connectivity is harder. Um, and uh, the, the, the more subtle thing is that IBM was doing a certain way to connect the gates that uh, is kind of difficult to get to work. And in fact, when they ran it from, you know, simultaneous to the whole circuit, uh, they got a, you know, a much more degradation than we did. Uh, IBM is now going to adjustable couplers, which is what we saw in this experiment was the way to go. And, I, you know, here I've heard that we're getting really good results and the like. And uh, from what I hear, I think they are probably ahead of Google because they know how to make qubits with really long coherence times, and then they're getting the adjustable couplers to work. Now, I think they're still working to get the calibration to work, uh, and, you know, so they haven't, you know, published anything, uh, you know, definitive yet, but it's very impressive. And, and the hard part is getting, doing the qubit fat, and they've worked with more people and longer uh, on that, and uh, you know, I think that it's great for the field because I think you know they're they're, they're going to show that you can build these things. Uh, good evening, Professor. Thank you for the talk. Uh, good evening, thank you for the talk. I think it was really interesting. Uh, I would like to ask uh, two questions. Uh, so, uh, from your talk, I got uh, I got the sense that essentially, since we Explaining that the number of qubits doesn't seem to be uh, uh, the biggest problem, but the coherence time seems to be a very common issue. I would like to ask you so, if that impression was correct, uh, if I heard of that right, and uh, what's the major roadblock in your, in your opinion uh, to increasing the coherence time? What's the, what's the What's the physical mechanism of the bad coherence time? Um, no. Is there a limitation? What's, is there a fundamental limitation? Oh, a fundamental yeah, limitation. And how do we, how do we, yeah, what's, what's the next step for higher quantum tolerance? So, um, what, okay, uh, so I'll answer. So, you know, I'm, I'm trying to, to do a startup company. And I think if we do get the high gate speeds that we saw here, but with a coherence time of 200 microseconds, then our errors will be below 10 to minus 3. And that will be a fantastic quantum computer. Because although you had to work on the control, the control seemed you know, like you could do that well. And, uh, you know, that's the first thing that, you know, I'm focusing on and want to do. And, you know, that's hard because you have to really understand your error mechanisms of your qubits when you make a complex device. I think IBM has figured a lot of that out, but they aren't talking about it. And, you know, of an individual bureaucrats have to do that. Now, IBM says that they've seen devices with you know, milliseconds or more. Uh, coherence times, they might be hero devices, but there, there is some uh, thought that we can do even better. But my feeling is, is if you have 200, 300, 400 microseconds, which you know, may take a few years, but you can do that, and you're in the, a few times 10 to minus 4 errors, you can build a quantum computer at that point. Right? And, you know, in my view, uh, if, if, if no one can lower their, their error rates, below where we are now, you know, 1%, half a percent, uh, you can't make a quantum computer. But if you can get the factor of 10, then things kind of look doable. You know, you have, it's, it's hard engineering. So that's what I'm focusing on. That's what other people are focusing on. But you have to really think carefully about all the things that are going wrong. And it's, it's too much physics mode right now in, you know, the coherence of these devices, and we need to, you know, get into more materials mode and do that a little bit carefully, and that's what we're working on. But just this afternoon, I looked at some data from the computer. I, I, I got some little hints of what's going on, and 
you know, it, it's a really interesting time to figure that out. Is it physics or systems engineering? Like the problem. The problem. Do you think this is system engineering? Um, uh, I, I hate when people say, oh, this quantum computing is just an engineering problem. <laughs> and I also hate when it's just, you know, the physicists know what to do. It's a combination of physics and engineering. And we have to do much better physics than we're doing now. And, you know, the, the XEB, this experiment is, I, I hope, an example of how to do really good, you know, testing of your qubits. And you have to do much better materials, and you have to understand how to do that right. You have to do much better fabrication. Those are engineering. But it has to be guided by the physics, right? You just can't go into TSMC and expect that they're going to make good qubits for you. This is a different process than CMOS. So I think it's really interesting because it's a combination of physics and engineering. And the, the ideas behind that is what I will talk about tomorrow. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I've really thought about how to combine this. But we have to do much better physics and much better, much better physics, much better engineering to get these things to work. One last question. There, there is a question over here. There, there's a question over there. You, we can we can kind of adjourn and then if people yeah. want to ask more questions yeah. we can do that if you want. Maybe last question. Um, so I think my question is quite similar, but do you think uh, physicists still have some challenges? I mean, do you think there will be some breakthrough like to improve this uh, quantum computer for the physics part, or is it just like optimization? Um, 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 I think we're in a superposition of all. <laughs> um, I think if you look at the neutral atoms. Uh, they've had a real breakthrough there in these Rupert states. And in fact, I'm talking to some people at UCSB in California that we need to sit down together and do a real system engineering analysis because I think they've done something. I think there's still some issues there that, you know, we need to understand. But that kind of looks like a breakthrough to me. But I'm not 100% sure. Uh, and then at the same time, you know, there's a lot to improve and a lot more to understand in these systems. Um, so they'll be a continued. So yeah, it's a very interesting time because all of this is possible. Well, thank you very much. With this question, I'd like to thank you. experimental and theoretical across campus and we are trying to build uh, this and uh, it's thanks to, to events like this that we can build this uh, culture and so I'm uh, very grateful to you for the beautiful uh, presentation and uh, we would like to invite you all to an aperitif which is uh, going to take place at the second floor here so you just go downstairs uh, so you're all welcome to join. Thank you very much. Again. <laughs>